It's Conduit News Radio with Paul Harrell. 870-275-9799 is the telephone number if you would like to be a part of the program today. Welcome back to the program. We've got the president of the Family Council, familycouncil.org. We have Mr. Jerry Cox is with us. Jerry, welcome and good morning to you, sir. Well, good morning to you guys. It's always a pleasure to be on the radio with you. Yes, sir. I completely agree with you. Uh, it's a, always a, a pleasure to have you on, sir. Um, I, I just wanted to have you on talk, talk about two things. The first thing is the status of Arkansas's um, uh, abortion law when it comes to what the, the judge has done. You know, it was a big victory when the Supreme Court did not take up arkansas's law that requires a you know a, a, a you have a contracting Sam. physician um uh you know if you're going to have a medically induced abortion talk give us an update on where we are with that well that case is on appeal once again to the eighth circuit because um planned parenthood came back and went back to christine baker the the federal judge here in town and of course she's been always very very favorable to planned parenthood uh, being very pro-choice, and so she found another reason, uh, so to speak, to strike down this good law that really just requires um, these doctors who do these drug-induced abortions to either have admitting privileges at a local hospital or have a contract with someone who does. I think most people think that their doctor has admitting privileges at a local hospital, that they can check them into a hospital. And the truth is, most do. But these abortion doctors don't. And so if these women have complications now, the way Judge Baker has ruled, then they have to go check themselves into the emergency room. And a doctor there sees them who has no idea what their medical history is, what medicines they're allergic to, or even why they're having all these issues. And so this is about the safety of women, and you would think that Judge Baker, being a woman herself, would at least be sympathetic to that, but apparently not. So now Leslie Rutledge, our attorney general, has thankfully appealed this to the Eighth Circuit, and the Eighth Circuit last time around slapped Judge Baker's hand, and I kind of think they're going to do the same thing this time. But we'll wait and see. But what it does is it allows Planned Parenthood to keep on doing abortions in the meantime. Yeah, and that's the and that's certainly the uh, the tragic part in all of this. Um, are you are you pleased so far with the idea of a Supreme Court justice, Brett Kavanaugh, uh, the the president yesterday nominating him? If he gets through the confirmation process, I was just saying last hour how optimistic I am at the concept of. Uh, you know, a, a pro-life law passing that gets challenged all the way to the Supreme Court and Roe versus Wade possibly being overturned. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the possibility of Roe being overturned is probably better or about to be better now, maybe than at any time since Roe was passed. And so uh, that doesn't mean that it's a slam dunk. I do think that you're going to see the trend continue where Roe is weakened uh, through other, you know, the upholding of good laws like the ones here in Arkansas. What some people don't know is we have probably three or four other good laws that are in the hopper, so to speak, that are being appealed by Leslie Rutledge on up through the court system. And so there's a real possibility that one of our good pro-life laws here in Arkansas could find its way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and it could be a part of that weakening of Roe. And I'd like to think that maybe we might even see it reversed one day. Because, see, there's no guarantee that this is the only uh, judge that uh, Donald Trump is going to have a chance to appoint, or mm -hmm. there may be others. Yeah. And so if he appoints some other good justices, then the possibility of Roe being overturned becomes much more real. Yeah, Jerry, I, I saw a meme on Facebook the other day that it was a quote, a false quote from Abraham Lincoln that said his biggest regret was appointing Ruth Bader Ginsburg as Supreme Court justice. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, some of those justices, you know, you look at them and you think, how are they still going? 
but uh, you know, some are going to hold on to the very end. It looks like. Yeah, it really does. Uh, so let's talk about issue one. I mean, speaking of being pro-life, uh, we've had you on before, and we've talked about how Family Council has been a multi-issue organization for a very long time. Um, issue one is the bad tort reform amendment that's going to be on the ballot. Uh, it's a, in my opinion, tort reform written specifically for nursing homes. Uh, are you hearing any more? When I had you on last time, you, you said that there were some legislators who'd maybe reached out to you privately who had voted for it initially, but have now changed their minds. Uh, any more developments in that arena? Not a lot, uh, but I think it's important to, to point out that these people are politicians, and so they have to find a way to save face. If they voted for issue one and then they've got buyer's remorse, then they have to find a way to gracefully step back. And, of course, we're going to do everything we can to give them that opportunity to step away from it because I want to see Issue 1 defeated. See, the thing is, a lot of people were not around the legislature back in 2003 when we were out there fighting an effort by the nursing homes to pretty much bulletproof themselves against lawsuits when they neglect an old person and let them die and are behaving irresponsibly. And so we saw that back in 2003, and this is the same song. I don't know if it's the third or fourth verse, but we're way down into it, but the nursing homes are doing the same thing that they've always done, which is try to make it so that good, honest people can't sue them when they neglect one of their, one of their loved ones. And so what they're trying to do now, of course, is not only to put a $500,000 value on the life of those elderly people in the nursing homes, but if issue one passes, the lobbyists for the nursing homes and these other powerful interests are going to influence lawmakers, I fear, so much that they're going to restrict the kinds of evidence that you can bring against the nursing home. That's the hidden canon in issue one, Everybody's focused on the $500,000 cap, and that's, that's bad. But what I believe even worse is the fact the legislature can decide what evidence can be brought into court when somebody's been abused or neglected in a nursing home or these other injury lawsuits. So if you can't bring evidence, you have no case. Mm -hmm. And a lawyer won't take your case because they know they, they're going to lose and they can't get paid. And so the whole idea then of accountability for these nursing homes collapses. We just heard of a New Jersey-based nursing home who owns a couple of our nursing home owner who owns two nursing homes here in Arkansas. Those homes were recently closed. Do you know why? Because they weren't feeding the people in the nursing home. Wow. They weren't feeding them. And so you can't tell me that this kind of thing is not going to increase if these Big outfits are shielded from lawsuits, and that's what Issue 1 does, and that's been the driving force behind it from the get-go. Man, uh, it, it, the stakes really are high. And, you know, when you're emphasizing here, Jerry, this idea that the legislature can set rules of evidence if this thing passes, and, vi and I, I think that would violate the separation of powers. It would certainly undermine it. Um, but I think the reason you're focused on that is because you've been down – at the Marble Palace for a long time, and you know how fast they can uh, amend a bill, they can put language here or there. I mean, I know you get notified sometimes, and here recently, you know, you got you got notified, oh my gosh, they're trying to, you know, slip something in here and essentially, you know, do backdoor tort reform, uh, and nobody knew about it, and you went down there and testified against it and got it killed. I mean, if they have the power to set rules of evidence, how in the world would we be able to keep up with them, you know, inserting a line here, or inserting a line there with all of the bills that they go through every single session? It would be a, a lot to keep up with. Well, we had one hour's notice during the special session uh, about a bill that would allow people who draw up contracts to put language in there where a person would unknowingly waive their right to a jury trial. And that would be in the case of insurance, uh, banking, uh, checking a person into a nursing home. You, you know how you see those pages and pages of information when you 
conduct some kind of transaction, and the people say, oh, trust me, just sign there. Mm -hmm. Well, buried in that could have been you're waiving your right to a jury trial if you get cheated and having to agree to binding arbitration instead. And that's the bill that we fought, and that's the kind of legislation that the nursing homes came with back in 2003. They don't want to land in court and have a judge and jury of regular citizens hear the facts against them because they know that good people are going to issue a just ruling, and that's not what they want. They want to be shielded from that, and they want to be able to cut services, cut staff, cut care, and be able to make more money and not be held accountable for it. And that's wrong, and that's why we say this is a human life issue. Mm. And that's exactly right. I mean, you guys believe in uh, the right to life from you know conception to natural death, and uh, yet we do have some people, Jerry, I mean, they, they actually are saying that if this passes, that we'll have better health care for our elderly. I mean, do you buy that argument? That is not true. We have spent weeks researching what went on in Texas. Everybody tells us how wonderful things are in Texas with their health care. Well, let me tell you something. Health care costs in Texas are more than the ones here in Arkansas. Hospitals in Texas, rural hospitals, did not increase during the time after tort reform in Texas, contrary to what you've been told. And these inflated numbers about how many doctors tort reform brought to Texas are wrong because if you look at the population increase of Texas, which went up about 20% during the period that they, they like to brag about, the number of doctors went up about that same amount. So the net increase in doctors in Texas as a result of tort reform was virtually nil. And so here's who it benefited. It benefited the medical malpractice insurance companies in Texas because they didn't have to pay out as many claims. And the doctors, I think, probably saw a decrease in their insurance rates, but we can find no evidence that, that they passed that savings on to people, their, their patients. What's more, the Arkansas law, issue one, we've learned this, Paul, is way more expansive than the Texas law. It goes a lot farther. The Texas law just focuses primarily on medical malpractice. This law here in Arkansas, issue one, covers any kind of injury lawsuits. So if you get wronged by your insurance company, then you're capped in what you can collect as far as non-economic or punitive damages. If you're wronged by um, some trucking company, uh, if you're you know hit by an uh, unsafe truck on the highway, then it applies to it. The Texas law focuses more narrowly on medical malpractice, and so do the laws in most of the states around us. They're focused largely on medical malpractice, and the ones who don't, guess what? You can break the cap that they've instituted in cases of death or serious injury and those kinds of things. So I'm pretty convinced that if issue one passes, we will have the most far-reaching, most restrictive t law of this kind in the whole region and maybe one of the most in the whole country. Mm -hmm. And so what, what they're doing, Paul, is issue one tricks good people into voting away one of their precious constitutional rights, and that is protected under the Seventh Amendment, the right to a jury trial. They lose some of that right. Wow. Jerry Cox, uh, president of the Family Council, you basically are just demolishing all of their arguments right here uh, live on the radio. I appreciate you coming on so much, and I, I do believe that uh, we do have to defeat issue one. Uh, because it is not good for the people of this state. It has got special interest all over it, and I appreciate the work that you're doing, sir. Well, uh, we are so glad to be in this fight, and let me tell you this. The legislature could have offered good tort reform. We were, we were for some other measures out there, but they would have none of it. They said, nope, we're going to do this one, and they just plowed ahead, and so they've left us no choice now but to oppose it. They could have given the people something good to vote on, but they didn't because they were so heavily influenced, I believe, by the special interest groups. Mm. 
Jerry Cox, president of the Family Council. Folks, go to familycouncil.org for more information about what they're doing, what they're up to. Jerry, you have a great day, sir. Okay. You guys have a good day, too. All righty. Hey, folks.